Hello all, this is Reggie Dokes and welcome to episode 5 of God Said Give Them Drum Machines Behind the Scenes Podcast. Happy New Year to you all. Appreciate you all staying with us on this journey. And, uh, you know, this is Black History Month, February, and uh, this edition is going to be very special. I also like to uh, welcome my team, uh, Jennifer and Dave and Christian. We got a... Uh, very special information for you uh team say hello please let's not forget we got our good friend eric jackson in the house too oh, that's right that's right eric jackson eric jackson What's happening, right, team? Brother. welcome welcome thanks eric for joining us eric Absolutely. along with david and christian and reggie uh is very much part of the team we're so happy to have him on this call with us today and we're so thrilled to have him work with us over the years with this project. And he's definitely been able to be the be the man on the streets, on the ground in Detroit for us when the rest of us live elsewhere. So um, thank you, Eric. Thank you. Um, your contributions do not go unnoticed. And um, we're happy to have you here today. It's good to be appreciated. Thank you very much. So, guys, Zaina Smith, quite frankly, is a Detroit icon. She has been one who has contributed to the culture, the, the fashion culture, the music culture of, of Detroit. Um, we talked about a woman who has had a business for 30 years called Spectacles in downtown Detroit. And she has touched so many lives, uh, whether they be artists in fashion or music. You know, Zaina had several nights, uh, one of which I can remember, uh, Mahogany. Uh, she also had the Downstairs Pub uh, in Detroit, which was a very, very popular uh, hot spot. You know, Zaina even touched my life personally. Um, you know, she had a lot to do with uh, my artistry coming up in the game. Um, she clothed me in terms of uh, photo shoots. Um, she did marketing for me and promotions. We even uh, had a night together. So I'm very grateful to, to, to Zaina. She has not only touched my life, but like I said, many others. Amp Fiddler, uh, Kenny Dixon, Theo Parrish. When Zaina had the Downstairs Pub, when she was doing that, uh, her DJ was uh, Ken Collier. He was the one that uh, was the resident and set, set the vibe and, and, and tone uh, for this place. He is, to us in Detroit, what Frankie Knuckles was or is to Chicago. That's that's the love and respect that we had or have for Ken Coyer. He 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 was that guy. People to this day still talk about how Ken Coyer really influenced uh, the dance scene uh, in Detroit. So let me stop talking. We have a great mix of DJ Ken Coyer, and uh, we want you to check it out. So today, like Reggie said, we are putting together um, features for Black History Month, and we thought it was very important to finally highlight a woman, considering our whole film is, like Christian says, a wiener fest. 
And we get questions all the time as to why and where all the women are all the time. And it's very hard in this genre, in this music industry to make a film <laughs> with uh, the female voice. Uh, so there are women, there have been women all along the way. They just weren't artists per se. Uh, today we like to feature and highlight a woman by the name of Zaina Smith, who's been part of the Detroit music and dance scene for, I don't know, 40 years. And she's also been part of the black business uh, community in Detroit for a long time. And we'd like to talk more about her and her contributions here today. And now I'm going to play a clip from an interview that we did some years ago with Zaina in downtown Detroit. Well, what happened um, in the 80s, we, um, a lot of the party promoters were giving parties in downtown Detroit at places like P Piper's Alley, which is uh, on Bagley, My Fair Lady, which was on Lafayette. Um, back then, guys were getting together and they were getting nightclubs. You know, you'd have three guys that would get a nightclub. Well, My Fair Lady was real popular and we had uh, three owners there and when they broke up, each one of them went and got their own club. Well, JB's uh, Julius Bender, it was JB. So he opened up JB's, which was in downtown Detroit, um, just blocks from um, the downstairs pub and then you had Studio 54. So you had different party groups that would give parties in different location. One way would be at um, JB's, uh, Take Three would be at the Downstairs Pub, Dave Humphreys would be at Studio 54, uh, Cosmopolitan would be at uh, the Gaslight, say for example. So um, when <clears throat> every now and then you would have the club owner would double book your night or uh, make it where you know you had to move the party. And uh, on one particular weekend uh, when we had to move the party from the Downstairs Pub, we moved it to JB's. It was, uh, and we called it Taboo Wear Red, and everybody came to the party in red. Um, Ken Collier was our DJ, and uh, right now JB's is uh, known as Cliff Bells. And it used to be known as Cliff Bells back in the 30s, in the 1930s. So if you went through our photographs, you would see that we were actually in that uh, historic building that the Purple Gang used to hang out in. Um, back in the 30s. So uh, JB's became a, a hot spot for different party promoters to go to. It was a go-to place and it had a lot of history and uh, you know great dark, it was a very dark drab place but it had that wonderful dance floor and uh, the downstairs too that you could um, have uh, your event. It could be up and down. What happened is um, the parties were very popular and so we wanted to, instead of just passing out a flyer, we wanted to do a little newsletter. So we came up with what we call Click It. And in this newsletter we would go around and report on the different parties. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it was a little popular but I, I guess people didn't really like to talk about their parties if they weren't successful. But in here we would have Ken Collier's playlists, um, pictures from the downstairs pub. We had a party English, different things that would, um, like a plugger was a flyer with a discount, you know, different things that we would say, like don't, meant your head or your mind, you know. So we would um, t use this to kind of like uh, uh, define what we were doing in the nightlife scene. Heaven was located at Seven Mile and Woodward, where the church is being built right now, yes, yeah. right across from Palmer Park. Right. And it was a late night spot. Um, but prior to Heaven, we had places like Luomo. Right. Luomo, which was also on uh, Seven Mile, East but Seven. East Seven Mile, and these were, um, Mike Neal put together that spot, and um, I think it was an abandoned warehouse, and that was our first little taste of, you know, um, warehouse parties for our young urban black children.
guys remember being young? Did any of that resonate with you? Zaina was was at the forefront. She's kind of you know the person who started the the uh, like the the theme. You know, like the white parties, the red. You know, she spoke about everybody having uh wearing red to the taboo party. She's like the first person to start those theme parties back in the day. So she's, you know, now you got Puffy doing white parties. That stuff is started by her, you know. She got like a, a long legacy in party promotion. I tell you, she started uh, um, giving those names, man. And just, uh, you know, all these uh, great memories started coming back, man. <laughs> Lumos. And Lumos, I to, yeah. Right. Then I got to thinking about Cheeks and Right. Uh, uh, oh my God. Uh, um, yeah, uh, th- there was the club uh, Taboo that was downtown uh, off the Taboo, railroad tracks. Uh, warehouse. Did I say that already? Uh, yeah, the warehouse. The U- UBQs. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Man, man, man. Great memories, man. Great memories. Great parties. You know, and, and, and you, I'm I'm so grateful that we are doing this uh, for Zayna. You know, we always talk about, um, you know, our mantra has been uh, since last year, really, to give people their flowers, you know, now while they're here, man. And, um, you know, this is long overdue. I know Zayna has, in my opinion, has always been one of those figures who, um, you know, pretty much likes she likes to be low key, but, uh, um, you know, this is, this is well-deserved this kind of attention, man, because, uh, like you said, brother, you know, she has contributed so much, uh, to the scene, the dance scene, um, you know, of Detroit. I was sharing with everybody, uh, the last time we met that, um, you know, Zaina also touched a lot of artists and uh, you know both fashion and music uh, especially music uh myself included in that you know taking pictures promoting people um you know doing parties you know we even had a, a a night that we would do together once a month um you know she's done a lot for people and um you know this is just a really good thing just letting the world know you know what uh this sister Zaina who um has been in business uh for whew, 30 plus years I think she said you know and 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 that's a long time to be an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and to be in business and to be in Detroit you know it's been a lot of folks that have come and gone around her you know I, I think of um places like Lewis the Hatter and um you know, which was there for centuries, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, uh, I, some of the other places uh, don't come to mind at this point. But, you know, a lot of businesses, man, have come and gone and she has remained steadfast and 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 and, and stable, um, you know, over these past 30 years as an entrepreneur. I remember she was telling me that and I didn't even know this, but prior to Spectacles, she had a spot called uh, Zena's Place, uh, and she yeah. said that was like a 2,000 square foot um, building that she was uh, operating out of. Yeah. I think I think she told me she had a couple businesses before. Yeah. Zena's Place yeah. was over on the, on the on the west side in the old Spiegel's building. Yeah. Okay, yeah, seven Spiegel. miles. Oh my God, Spiegel's that was building oh around the corner from my house. Yeah. So I, I remember going yeah. there. You're right. Yeah. That was- it, that was, you know, again, she was ahead of her time in terms of style. She, mm-hmm. and, you know, she yeah. was making sure that she was bringing brands that were not sold in Detroit. Mm-hmm. You know, right. bringing in, you know, for, you know, Spike's label, Forty Acres and a Mule, bringing, mm-hmm. you know, breaking right. brands like, you know, yeah. made, you know, Detroit versus everybody. You know, yeah. more recently, right? So, Maurice, yeah, she was a uh, trend not, Maurice Malone, oh, right? of course, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Maurice. Absolutely. Shout out to Maurice. You know, Williamsburg Garment Company. He's still doing it here in New York. So, you know. So, for those of you who aren't really familiar with Zayna or her store, Spectacles in Detroit, it is located downtown. It's on two thirty East Grand River Avenue, Detroit. Um, downtown. It's a clothing store, and it has a lot of I would say urban wear. 
right? Mm-hmm. Would you say mm-hmm. lots of t-shirts, sweatshirts for the urban community and has been there since the mid eighties, right? Or yeah. have had, she's had the store spectacles since the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. She sells, she sells, you know, accessories. She sells records. She breaks a lot of artists and, you know, you can go in there and find rare things every once in a while, you know, it's not as consistent, you know, she picks and chooses, she curates, you know, she's a curator and, yeah, and her like, space is a gathering place, you know, where, yeah. you know, like-minded people go to find right. out what's hot. She's a tastemaker. Right. Yeah. You're li- liable to see any number of DJs, you know, world renowned DJs in her place, you know, any given time. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, I know she, when we did that interview with Zena, she was talking about how um, the layout of the downstairs pub and the um, location to a place called uh, L'Esprit, which was owned by um, one of the Fords. I think he had this club for his, his girlfriend at the time that was up above the downstairs pub. So you had that kind of um, the... Um, uh, socioeconomic mesh- meshing that was taking place. People coming, they would hear that music with uh, Ken Collier, you know, banging, you know, because he would put together a sound system. Um, and then he introduced um, Daryl Shannon and uh, Delano Smith, you know, when they were an, in their infancy. So, you know, you had folks, you know, that were very, you know, um, affluent being able to hear this great music. You know, I'm sure they were they were drawn to hearing this great music downstairs after they're having a nice meal and cocktails. And, you know, you got this, um, you know, really cool scene happening downstairs. So that was, I know that was pretty, pretty, pretty great for Zena. You know, it's pretty great. I have a question. She so, laid out the, uh, you know, laid out the so was it, I know it's, you know, it's like normal to see a female promoter nowadays, but back in the day um, during this, you know, all this research that we've done for this film and all the interviews that we've done with like Todd and all these, all these other males, men that have really been the ones to, for, you know, organize and throw these parties and all that. How, how different or exciting was it to see a woman do this work as well. Yeah, well, like I said, she was she was the only one at the time, really, mm-hmm. in that particular genre that was putting together um, parties l- like that. But what she was coming with was, you know, uh, with, with Ken Collier, he did the the uh, a fantastic light show. But with Ken, he was like a um, a sound engineer. You know, he would build um, a sound system that was you know, unparalleled, you know, even, you know, if you go look at the places where he built sound systems um, all the way to um, heaven, you know, club heaven um, was just, you know, I mean, it was, you're, if you're a person that's into sound technology, he was, he was, he just took it to another level, you know, and getting into, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask before you go any further. That sound system weren't weren't they trying to uh, do like a, a a tour, like a travel like tour? Yeah, they were history gonna, of that sound system. Yeah, do a tour or put it in a museum. It should be right. You know, um, like I said, because he was really ahead of his time mm. in sound, and you had like a lot of people that would that would you know uh, copy it or try to emulate that. Right. You know, he was like. Um, I think one of the first guys who was he was putting the uh, subwoofers like in the in the the floor, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, just wow. the way he would you know build the sound systems in clubs was just he was just you know mm-hmm. uh, ahead of his time, you know. Wow. Yeah, and I want to jump in there because when you talk about those sound systems, <clears throat> on some level we kind of forget uh, Russ from Audio Light and really what Audio Light really brought to the whole, I guess the whole scene because we were renting equipment from them. So this sound system that can help build really was uh, coming from Russ. Right. You know, Russ is one of the, and actually early on, I want to say maybe five years ago, I reached out to Russ 
you know, just on a phone call trying to connect with him. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I just remember just how uh, we, you talked about the speakers putting the subs in the floor and stuff, but just how for years people mm-hmm. talked about how um, that sound system really made you feel and how mm-hmm. Ken's earlier sound systems really kind of, uh, as Zayna puts it, uh, all the, it was for music lovers. Mm-hmm. And um, I really believe that uh, in terms of Ken's work in terms of audio, that a big part of that was Russ's expertise that in audio lights equipment that was helping facilitate Ken's right. kind of his thoughts on what the sound system should be. Not, not well, Christian, for those folks. That and you also know. had Duncan sound also at the time back then too, Duncan sound. Yeah, but that, that Duncan sound and what Ken Kyer and them were doing, they were two different sides of yeah. the wall. Yeah. Christian, now, you know, for those folks that don't know who Russ is, you know, Bro, Russ, as I understand, because I, I I met him later on, but Russ was an audio, it was an audiophile, and he had a store where you could go and rent equipment, and uh, he fixed equipment. So he was just one of those uh, sound uh, experts that were left over from the Motown era, you know, mm-hmm. that had insight into that early era part of Detroit's musical legacy. And when we had, I guess, I want to say the barren years where Motown left, funk is still there, but the DJs are growing. I think Russ's uh, significance, because I I believe his business was in Redford. Okay. Uh, And uh, his significance in terms of giving uh, DJ systems that they would put into these places or augment systems, because let's say Todd and them, they had a system, but you had to go to somebody else who had the big Sherwin Vegas or, wow. you know, which were, which back then were those to have Sherwin Vegas at your gig. That was like a big deal. Yeah, and so, uh, premier, uh, you know, premier. Yeah. premier sound. So yeah. again, I liken Russ in his legacy to helping a lot of these early DJs get the proper sound system necessary to blow these clubs out, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. So Zena has been, this is for the director. Zena has been on and off or in and out of our film since the beginning. I thought in the beginning, it was very refreshing. Like I was saying before, after hearing and seeing so many men, um, you know, contribute and be a part of this film. It was really refreshing to finally see a woman uh, who was part of the scene tell her story and her contributions too. So what is, so how, you know, what does, what does somebody like Zaina mean to this story, Christian, as a, as a, as a cultivator of the scene and culture and party promoter, what does, to you in your own words, what does she mean to the story, why has she been in and out of the film? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, it's like when you're trying to tell this story about this history, um, there's so many voices and characters that played a role, people that played a role. So as you're trying to tell this story in 90 minutes you know man you always it's, that's the hardest part of this that's I mean, you know for people who ask and i'll get to zane in a second but a lot of people ask like why has this taken so long like are you uh over kind of trying to perfect it and stuff like that and it's really Dude, it's, it's so many voices and it's so many voices that are important. You know, just over time, I've had to always, like Zayna's voice rings in my head. Like, I don't even have to, uh, I don't have to call Zayna or whatever. I can just conjure up Zayna in my mind and uh, I can hear this interview, you know. I hear what she says. 
Uh, sometimes I go back and listen to it, but you know, the downstairs pub came in and out of the story. And that's how Zayna fits in here for me. So just over time, the downstairs pub and how Ken, Ken's origin story and how that has, you know, how we've kind of played around with that. Um, it's just necessary now in order for it to be chronologically correct in terms of how this music has spread across the world that we hold on to what happened at the downstairs pub because a lot of people that came out of the downstairs pub uh, are important inside of this music today. So, uh, you know, just going back and forth and just trying to find the right story made it to where uh, Zayna is always on the bleeding edge of that. And so just the fact that she didn't DJ, the fact that she didn't make a record, the fact, you know, those facts make it like, well, damn, how can I keep her in a film? But the fact that this downstairs pub happened and where it happened within the timeline of Detroit techno, it makes it to where her impact on this music is unquestioned, unquestionable. Her relationships with Jeff Mills, her relationships with Blake Baxter, her relationships with all the DJs in the city is something that, you know, I'm very well well aware of, and I just try to make sure that, uh, you know, I uh, represent her in the scene as best I can. So, you know, that's why she falls in and out. I, th I think it's also important to mention that, you know, it wasn't just, you know, her past contributions to why she's important to the scene today. I think also, to correct me if I'm wrong, but she's really a historian as well, correct? No, is without it? question. Without question, yes. Eric, you might want to follow up on that, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You would have to definitely say that um, Zayna was a catalyst to uh, the, the techno situation because um, she, she was an influencer. She influenced um, Juan Atkins. You know, he speaks of the, you know, going to the downstairs pub, getting his mind blown. And, um, you know, Juan was producing music. He didn't so much want to be a, a DJ starting out, you know, but going to the downstairs pub, seeing what was going on. Um, and I think uh, Derek dragged him to the, you know, to the pub. It was like, uh, you know, you got to come check this out. Took him down there. I mean, they were both um, influenced by what was going on at the downstairs pub. You know, it made them, you know, want to be DJs. You know, it, it was, it was, so there, she was in essence a catalyst to them wanting to, you know, be DJ and uh, kind of uh, laying out how to throw parties and, you know, just, to, it, it just, it, like I said, she was, the best I can say it is that she was just a catalyst for what happened. Does anybody has, does anybody have any like real life downstairs pub memories? Anybody here? Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, for those folks that don't know that are listening or that are listening to this, you know, explain the vibe uh, of, of, of downstairs pub. You know, for me, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was, you know, you, you, you went down these steps, uh, these winding steps. Uh, it, it was always dark. I think at, at one point, the only light that was on was was like uh, uh, behind the DJ booth. Do I do I have the the, the dance floor was kind of small. Do I, do I have it right, y'all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I remember going in there because as a kid underage, I could sneak in there uh -oh. and it was dark, so I could like dip in, dip off to the side <laughs> quick, and they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't check me, you know. So I remember that a lot. You know, we would that's a place we could get into and we could hear really, really deep beats and we could really um, you know, get exposure to the scene. And it shaped a lot of us you know, as youngsters because you know, we could we could and, sneak and, in. And, and, and I oh, think yeah. the DJ booth yes. or the DJ area. Exactly. Uh, it was was floor level the, the, is that right and 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 you, you right you were almost like yep. looking at the djs through like a a, a, a cut out 
uh, like hole in the wall, if you will. Uh, very small area, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But the the vibe, the energy was just uh, was just was incredible. <laughs> Yeah, the DJ was a star in spaces like that where the DJ's on the floor. The DJ's the star. And so people are able to see it and it impacts them because they see what the DJ's doing. Whereas like Cheeks had it up. You know, the DJ was up a little bit. And some of the other clubs, they had the DJ up off the floor. So you couldn't really see what was going down. So I think that is a huge catalyst to uh, people wanting to become DJs. Yeah, absolutely. I know Alan, Al Alan Esther... Uh, mentioned how he would go into the bathroom and get in, in the stall and, and stand up on the toilet and just, you know, get in the stall and wait, you know, because I guess before it, it was, you know, a, a restaurant, what have you, or a bar, he would go in there, get go into a stall, get in uh, on top of the toilet, <laughs> close the door and wait until, you know, the, the night turned over and then come out, you know. Okay. okay. That was pretty uh, hilarious. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we all had our methods of getting in. <laughs> right. right. You know. Wow. Yeah, I love it. I love it. But, you know, I mean, I, I think that, again, being able to see the DJ helped yeah. and it allowed people to experience the technology you know, as I love what um, what Christian was saying in terms of people who were sound technicians and who right. impacted us with the speakers. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you had the the people that came later, you know, the Duncan Sounds and then, the you know, Deep Space and Direct Drive, where the technology became a part of DJing. And right. those are the things that led to people using drum machines and people getting into drum machines and, and kind of closed the loop on the technology that, that became um, what was used to create Detroit Techno. Yeah, absolutely. Because it was like the way it progressed, it was like the, the Duncan sound. Um, you had um, a group called Laserdisc. And that group, Laserdisc, I guess some of the guys who started Laserdisc or that were in Laserdisc left and formed Direct Drive. And Direct Drive kind of just mm. took off into the stratosphere. <laughs> and they ruled for, for a good minute. And then, you know, Deep Space came along, you know, and uh, incorporated the drum machines and, you know, took it to another level. But, uh, yeah, Direct Drive had a good, good long run, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, good long no, run. No. No, no disrespect to uh, uh, Deep Space, man, but Direct Drive had a huge impact on me coming up as a youth. Uh, and oh, yeah, DJ. absolutely. I, mean, that, they were yeah. It. I, I, I yeah, remember absolutely. Steve. The, the, I remember the, Steve Direct Dunbar. Drive were the, were, were the Detroit Pistons right, to the, right. the, the, the Chicago Bulls for them, you know? Exactly. They, 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 pushed, exactly. They, they pushed Deep Space to be what they were. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. What they and became they, you know, I, I remember going away to college and mm -hmm. Deep Space would spin at TSU and I had from Alabama, ha I would drive up there because Deep Space was within, you know, three hours of where I was. Right. Like wow. they would tour and hit Amazing. HBCUs and, yep. you know, they had a nationwide appeal and they would yeah. like, pack the spaces in yeah. in T Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just, I just remember those jackets, man. I just remember those jackets, <laughs> you know. I just remember those jackets, man, and just looking at it like, damn, I wish I could wear one of those right now. They they were like God. Yeah, right. Man. They were. You know? Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. hey, think about it. That's a full circle. You know, branding the right. party right. clubs that branded themselves like brats, you know, with the with the blue jean, uh, you know, Shabatino. Which one had the blue jean jacket with the cursive? I think Bratz, that was Bratz and yeah. Commodores. Yeah, had yeah. Denim jackets with the stitched <laughs> and snobs had yeah. stitched jackets. I mean, had the denim jackets with the stitched lettering of their clubs on the back. Oh, yes. My God. Yes. Snobs. Snobs. He don't have the, have the silky. <laughs> Right, the right. <laughs> right, the satin, right, right. 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 And, and, and remember the hardware Letterman jacket? You yeah. remember the hardware yeah. Letterman jacket with the white yeah. sleeves and the Charlie Brown yeah. on the back? Right, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so branding is important. And Zayna, people like Zayna helped us form our style and right. and helped with this whole thing so we can't you know ignore tastemakers and yeah. how they styled us and DJs and, and made that part of the scene. 
Right. Since we're talking about that hardware jacket with the Charlie Brown shit, because that, that was that was epic. That was Definitely my neighbor, my neighbor, game ship. And, and hardware and um hardware was kind of like how do you say it? Like they just came out of nowhere and kind of had a couple gigs, but the name hardware just lives on forever. And that's James Ship. That's Steve Dunbar as well. <laughs> yeah, bro. That was uh, their their marketing. They took it to the next level. They actually yeah. taking it to the Letterman jacket, mm-hmm. you know, the little silky uh, or the little satin jacket that the uh, Direct Drive mm-hmm. and Gables had it was cool. Yeah. They came with the Letterman jacket. It was a different day. Yeah. Right. And, you know, that was part of it. We were entrepreneurs and we were branding. The party clubs were entrepreneurs and they understood branding. They understood marketing, the flyers, the collections that we have. Me and Eric, you know, all of us have the flyer archives because Ooh, they yeah. were that the epic design. in terms of their design. Oh, my Your goodness. hardware was giving you Ziggy, you know, and, right. and would change all the text. And, you know, the, right. the, 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 char- the cartoon characters that resonated with us as kids. That, that, that was network. That was yeah, network. network. Greg okay, network. Yes, yes. Ziggy, you know? yes. Hardware with Charlie Brown. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Wait, I have a question. Since I'm a little bit younger than everybody, yes. I don't remember the downstairs club. I do remember spectacles. I, d- I remember the Music Institute, of course. Uh-huh. But all that other stuff that you guys are talking about, Bratz and Shabatino, yes. that's all just like stuff I had heard about, you know, from my right. older friends. And those were kids. These were kids doing this. This what these weren't adults. Right. These were kids. That's the key. That's the key because a lot of people Black went kids. on to become entrepreneurs, yeah. like yeah. Zayna. Right. You know. No, right. I actually, oh, let's let's step back. Zayna was not a kid. Zayna yeah, was absolutely. She was no, no. She was adult Zayna, parties. You know, yeah. Zayna, the the club, those little clubs I, were. You know, those. I were know. Kids. I know, yeah. but I just want to clarify, bro. Zayna and them were grown. They were grown. Yeah, Zayna, yeah. yeah, exactly. And the kids they learned were, from them. Yeah, That's the key. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the kids learned from them. These promoters, right. they taught the younger generation. And they right. took it and blew it up and added their own branding, their own style. And, you know, so again, we followed the style of Zayna is really what I'm trying to say. We right. were following right. these people you know, who were styling us and showing us what style was. Right. So because tell me all of that Shabatino and all that stuff, that was stuff, that stuff was marketed to high school students. Yeah. You know, but tell me what, you know, just tell me why this stuff is so important to this story. Why is the teen party scene? Why is the clothes? Why is Shabatino? Like tell me for somebody that doesn't really know about these, these names and direct drive and, you know, what? why is this stuff important to our story, Christian or Dave? Yeah, I mean, I think that the key is we all know that these party clubs were embracing technology. They were incubators for DJs. They were incubators for art. They were what made the techno artists emerge. They they molded what an artist was while they were a group. They they blew up various artists like Juan and you know all of these guys that came out of uh, DJ crews also you know became uh, learned how to market themselves through these groups. You know, Eric, what do you, what do you think? You agree with that? I'm I'm curious. You know, Christian. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, and, and and like the most important thing is that the audience grew. I mean, it, you know, the, it, 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 they, you know, got a taste of it from, you know, checking out what Zayna put out there, but then mm-hmm. everything being marketed to high school kids, we all grew and then became college kids. And then we were college graduates and the parties and were still going, you know, so we just, we, we grew with the, with the genre, you know, we, we, we grew with it. Yeah, you know? and and we took it around the world too. A lot of us well, went yeah, away it, to different places. Made it global, yeah. And and right. and of course, the DJs also went to other right. places, and that helped it spread. So all right. of this culture was helped. This it was what helped this thing to spread. Right. Okay, I'm going to play another clip 
from this was Eric's interview. Do you remember when you did this, Eric? Wait, I do not. <laughs> I think this was uh like two thir- 2013. Christian, wow. would you say? 2013, wow. 2014. Wow. And, and just tell me where were you when you recorded this on camera interview? Do you remember? I'd have to see it because I, you know. <laughs> well, you were, I can I I mean, I remember what it was. She was sitting in a look what looked to me like a vacant lot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your brother Jason actually uh, shot it. And she was sitting where uh, the downstairs pub and the spree used to sit. So it was, uh, we're in a, we're on the, we were on Shelby and Larnett on the corner is where it was. And um, yeah, that's where she sat and was like, you know, this is, but I can't, was, was that? Yeah, I guess that was like, yeah, 2012, 13, something like that. Yeah, it was a while back. Wow. Right. Mm. We've been at this for a while. Uh, We've been working together for a while. I appreciate everybody's patience with this. I'm going to play this other clip, this second clip real quick. Well, back then, you know, the main the main promotion was a flyer. And then we had what we call pluggers. And these pluggers, you could get discounts to get in or uh, the party got so, so bad. You know, we would have people scalping our uh, free invites and free passes outside the club, right. you know. This is free digital, so, yeah. you know, how did you go about making the flyers? Well, you would have uh, graphic designers that would do a little typesetting and then, you know, give it to a printer or either make copies back then. But uh, the best way to get people to your party um, was to um, call them on the telephone, a personal invitation. Uh, back then, we would have other little groups of uh, the boys, I would get a group of guys together, and maybe we would do birthday parties. Um, and, and some of those people that were in the different um, groups that we would form, um, kind of like a record company almost, um, they would do promotional parties to keep the interest going at the parties. So how do you see the downstairs pub influence on the Trek Well, people like... Uh, Derek May, they were always there because of the love of the music. It really had to do with um, what Ken Collier brought to the table. Um, the uh, the tempo that he played the music and his selection, um, it just entranced the crowd. Collier, please, for the people that don't know who are listening, somebody explain who Ken Collier is. Mm. Ken Collier is the, the, the godfather of the, the DJs of, of Detroit. Ken Collier is just like what Frankie Knuckles is to Chicago. Mm. Um, they were actually friends. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, he's he's Ken Collier is the, the godfather. I remember when he had a disco program on WCHB. And um, then later he had a progressive, it was called progressive music. He had a progressive radio program on WLBS. That was, um, Mm -hmm. oh man. I mean, Ooh, I mean, it was, he was, he was, he had people out here like Mojo had folks out, you know, getting, you know, next to the radio, waiting for his spot to, to come on and hear this progressive music that he was playing. It was like, 
unlike anything folks had heard at the time because it was like you know this is after disco and then he you know came with this uh, a progressive radio program that was uh that was that was uh man i, I that was dope one of the dopest things i'd ever heard as a kid you know um no words <laughs> right, right. no words man for for me um and, and and you know eric so eloquently put it what Frankie Knuckles was to Chicago. Yes. I mean, he, Ken Coyer was to us in Detroit. And so I remember there was this club downtown. Um, it was called, and correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I forget what it was prior to, but it was called rich and famous. Oh yeah. Right. And so, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know how everybody in the black community has play club play cousins, right? So I had this this play cousin named <laughs> Jeff, Jeffrey Smith, and we went down there. I had my records in a crate, and he convinced, I guess, the promoter and the guys at the door to let me in because at the time, you know, I was you know I was in high school, uh, and uh, so my play cousin Jeffrey, he was so smooth, man. He got us in the door. And I remember looking up at that DJ booth and then finally walking into the, you walked up some steps into the DJ booth. And I was just like, oh my God, I just immediately became intimidated. And Ken Collier was the DJ, right? He hadn't arrived yet. So the promoters turned to me and they're like, look, you better rock this. You hear what I'm saying? If you, if you whack, you're going to have to get the hell up out of here. Th they're exact words. So I, I'm nervous as hell. I started DJing. And then that good old uh, progressive record, uh, Martin Circus, that my uh -oh. daddy paid $50 for, uh, I put on that turntable and started playing it. And in walks Mr. Ken Coyer into the DJ booth. You talking about nervous? <laughs> so he 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 you know he's bobbing his head and he walks up to me and he's like he's like man let me show you how to work this get out the way man i stepped back that brother was working that eq man that was the first time i had ever experienced a dj working an eq on a work like in the that. box right work, working that work box. In the box thank you and 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 I was just that I was just so blown away, man. And 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 you know, I know uh people from my era that were DJs, you know, will, will probably say the same thing that man, when you were in the DJ booth with Ken Coyer, man, it was an experience. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was an experience. And and in retrospect, at the age that I am now, I look at it as a blessing now, you know, to even have been in his presence, man, because Mm -hmm. That brother just he he did a lot for us uh in terms of the music scene. What does progressive mean? I used to say it, oh yeah, I like progressive. I didn't really know what I was talking about. So the question was, what is progressive? And I think that what the easiest way that I would describe it is it was post-disco. Mm -hmm. It was a mix of, you know, Talio House, you know, groups mm -hmm. like Kano, groups like um, John Roca. Um, it was a mixture of um, post new wave uh, mm -hmm. electronic music, um, you know, where you'd get, yeah, synth, yeah, exactly, or, and electro, you wow. know, so you had a mix mm -hmm. of, you know, Hashim Nafish, you know, you had, yeah. you know, a mixture of, um, you know, what, what New York is called B-Boy, you know, B-Boy right. classics, yeah. and that Electro was also mixed. And, and one of the things I would say, wasn't Ken one of the first DJs to actually start you know, blending and, and mixing oh, yeah. two turntables? Absolutely. He was among Absolutely. the first. I'm not going to say he was the first. That, right. That's what made his radio program so right. dope. Right. Nobody was doing that. <laughs> right. Right. You know, we, we talk that's important. We right. talk in 19... Was it 1980 yet? 80, I think this was, right. Yeah. It was 1980 yeah. just yeah. on the radio right. blending? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Letting two tracks ride? Right. Uh-uh. Right. 
that blew our minds, you know, because that's where the artistry really, you're making a new song when you blend exactly. two tracks and let it ride for 10 minutes, you know, exactly. that's a whole different song, you know, yeah, so yeah. the artistry became that. And then, you know, drum machines had to be used to start emulating that, to, you know, loops, sequencing loops, you know, that, that all came in, you know, reel to reel, splicing yeah. reel to reel live, you know, all of those things came into play. And guys like Ken started that whole you know, way, yeah. you know. When you, start talking, about, uh, when you start mm -hmm. talking about some of the splicing and the beat machines though, bro, you're, you're talking, you're talking five to seven years from Ken. Oh yeah. There's, yeah absolutely. there's like a, there's like a period between, let's just say 76, 77 and um, 81, yeah. you know, just really that 81, 81 is when you finally have uh, alleys of your mind. You know, uh, yeah. 82 is um, Planet Rock. Yeah. <laughs> so Ken's period of um, kind of mentoring and exposing young people to this music was was a nice swath of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's important to say. I agree with you 100 percent. You know, he mentored. You know, he really, you know, he taught so many cats how to blend, you know, and he got that. And again, I'm not going to say definitively he got that, but he saw that in Chicago. There were guys, you know, uh, Frankie Knuckles saw that maybe in New York, maybe, you know, at, at the loft, you know, with Nicky Ciano and these guys. And, you know, so again, it moved, but again, they didn't blend at the loft. That was er way early. So I think Chicago yeah. might've been the first time, you know, people saw that, but again, I don't know. What, what do you think? What are my other his techno historians here? When do you think yeah. guys, yeah, I, where, did, where did they see it before that? Yeah. I think Ken Collier would, I would, I would give him the father of that, uh, that, that blend and letting, mm -hmm. letting tracks ride. And, um, you know, like I said, his his pupils, um, Daryl Shannon and um, uh, Delano, Delano Smith, mm -hmm. even Al Esther. Al Esther was a pupil of um, Ken Collier's too. Al Esther could yeah. he was a blend king, a blend master. Right. To let tracks ride, you know, um, like that. Um, another thing too is I actually went to high school with Ken's brother Greg. Mm, okay. that's how i got to, you know i got to you know know who he was through greg you know greg was a dj too he played mm. different style of music though but yeah that, that's how I, that, my introduction to ken collier was through his brother greg you know all right all right two, two things from my point of view nikki siano and uh what was happening with uh dave uh, is it that Mercurio, Marcus, what's his name? Who, who had David, law? David, David <laughs> Bro, I think they was way ahead of the curve when it came to uh, blending and mixing, number one. Mm -hmm. So Ken is post what was happening in New York. Uh, secondly, I think, man, a lot of this Ken fandom, we kind of lose sight of Charles Hicks. And Charles Hicks, even though he might not be uh, known for progressive music or whatever, but dude, Charles Hicks, Hicks and Company, they was there too. And when Zayna talks about the downstairs pub, she talks about Ken, but she also talks about Charles Hicks. Nice so really, too. Ken and Charles Hicks were really the only two DJs that she booked. Ken allowed yeah. other DJs to spin with him. That is where Daryl Shannon. I mean, excuse me, that is where Delano Smith comes into the fore, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. But really, bro, Ken, Charles Hicks, Hicks and Company, mm -hmm. uh, Dwayne in the mix. Like, it's a lot of people that we kind of like roll over when we say, you know, Ken, when we just talk about Ken's greatness. But <laughs> no, not taking anything from Ken, but I just want to say, hey, Charles Hicks, I, I hear your name. I know your name, brother. I love you. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Dwayne in the mix. I hear your name. Dwayne Bradley, yep. Yeah. 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 And then, then, and then the mix. Show. Yes, Hick but let me just say, and then Stacey Hill. You know, yeah. we talk yeah. about women. We talk yes. about uh, yeah. what they brought to this. You know, right. Stacey Hill in uh, the early Hot 80s. Wax. Stacey Hot yeah. Wax Hill yeah. uh, is just as pivotal, pivotal, it's just as important Right. is these DJs that we mentioned. I just sometimes step back because 
Stacy's importance is great, but it also came. She she her peak came at a time where cats started making records. Right. right. And I just sometimes look back and I'm curious why she never made a record in that moment. Shout out to Kelly Hand, who made records in those right. moments. Yeah. And yeah. early K-Han. Kelly Hand, K Hand. So salute to K Hand, but uh who who also we've interviewed. And um I have to say that some of her early history as it relates to uh, ghetto tech and ghetto ghetto tech and kind of that sound is really where I see her kind of like evolving in this picture, Mm -hmm. you know, so maybe uh, I might be wrong on that end, but uh, that's why I haven't necessarily included her into this story. But, you know, Stacy, Zaina, they have definitely been two women who I've, Throughout making this film, I've tried to figure out how to keep in the story. Yeah, Stacy, yeah. Stacy, definitely, man. I, I think for, for me uh, coming up, that was definitely mind blowing to see a young woman in the DJ booth because you know, shit at the time it was all dudes. You know what I yeah. mean? And then here comes the sister who is just as good, and in some cases right. better. <laughs> and, and, and not only that, <laughs> Stacy Stacy was fly. Right, right. No she doubt. Sure was. She let's, sure let's, was. let's be clear. Sure Laura Bugatti <laughs> glasses, right. oh, yeah. blouses, change. Oh, yeah. Pull that picture up of her with them glasses on, man. She right. did, bro. Yeah. Like, let's, let's, let's be clear. Add on and, the spectacles. And, <laughs> and she was on par with the dopest DJs in the city. So it was almost like Stacey Hale, Jeff Mills, Al Esther at Cheeks. You can add in John Collins, forgive me or not. But I will say when it was Stacey Hale, Al Esther, and, uh, you know, I guess John Collins was there, but I just remember it being Stacey Hale and Al Esther at Cheeks. That's because, you know, I was an Al sick of fan. Yeah. They really at that um, time Stacy was there was no DJ as big as Stacy in this time. Yeah, she didn't was. she have a residency at the warehouse? Wasn't she that yeah, the warehouse yeah, for a yeah, while? She did. And, and she did and, a radio show for the, the warehouse. Yeah, yeah, she should. Yeah, did. that was epic. You know, yeah. that was a time that really influenced us. You know, so mm-hmm. I, I agree one hundred and fifty percent. We can't sleep on the um, innovations that you know that, that a lot of women in Detroit, you know actually led and kept alive you know mm-hmm. so yeah we got to give respect to all of those you know all shout out to chancia chancia's records you know what i'm saying oh, like bro, oh, it, oh, oh, oh shit you're going it, back bro. like we we can uh <laughs> like bro we can point to women who played a pivotal role in this mm-hmm. music of mm-hmm. course you know it from the ur side you know you got joy santiago you got mike bank's sister i mean it's it's women in this sphere you know, right? So, uh, in me making the film early on, bro, I because of my connections with Juan and Derek and and uh, Eddie, you know, I, by the time I brought, I understood Stacy's position in this story. I was trying to keep her in the in the film. So sometimes it'd be like uh, it's almost like in Hollywood where if you got one black actress. The, that's the act, actress. And so for moments in making this film, I had one woman in the film. That's the woman in the film. You know what I mean? Despite, you know, her, Stacy's legacy and Zayna's legacy. You know what I mean? Like Zayna's, le- their legacies are, are great. Yeah, bro. So that's, that's how uh, Zayna falls in and out of the story. That's how Stacy falls in and out of the story. And, and, you know, once we start really focusing in on this picture of the Techno 6, it's like, well, damn, they not in the Techno 6. You know, how do I just my storytelling has had to evolve to figure out how to keep these stories, these pivotal stories that both Stacy and Zayna possess inside of our narrative. You know, is is I mean, Let's be real, y'all. The 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 story of this time period is so rich. Hell, you go down w- one road and it leads to five or ten different other paths. You know, as it as it as it relates to this story, man, of Detroit techno and what people contributed. So I I know your your job isn't easy, man. But it's 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 a deep and rich story, 
And um, at the end of the day, it needs to be told, you know? Absolutely. That, that's I, one well, of the reasons we have we created this podcast is to be able to highlight many of the people who may not make the final cut. And so that allows Christian to be the storyteller and to create the story arc that's going to make this a feature film. And so, yeah, don't, you know, I interview so many, I, you know, got a hundred hours of interviews everybody's not going to make it. So we don't want the people we love to be offended. We just have to let them know that, you know, you got to let the, you know, the the director create the story and it's going to go where it goes. Everybody may not be included, but we're talking about as many as we can here. Absolutely. I also wanted to make mention that even if her voice has been on and off our timeline over these 10 years, what hasn't changed is her archive. Right, Christian, she's had, she kept pictures from this time that we've been able to use in the film, whether her voice is on or off. And without those pictures, Christian, what would, what would that film, what would that part of the film look like? I, I mean, that part of the film would look like, uh, I guess we're talking heads. You know, the whole thing about making a, a documentary film is that um, the pictures tell the story. So without any of these archival pictures and this archival video, I mean, it's simply then uh, an interview or a talking head. But we've stretched ourselves to be more... Uh, better storytellers. So we we thank God Zaina gave us those pictures because it allows us to really illustrate that time and period where this early dance music was evolving in Detroit. Um, Reggie, your, your interview, the question that you asked her um, on your interview last week was, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give up and coming, I guess it was tastemakers in Detroit today and what I really liked that she said was, she said, you got to be good p- to people. Yes, definitely. She was like, you know, be be good to people, be honest, uh, be upfront, you know, and that's those are some things <laughs> that you, you know, don't hear uh, often, you know, entrepreneurs uh, saying. Right. Oh, and here's that clip now. The thing about it is honesty is the best policy and um, you can't stay in business if you don't treat people right. Mm. So I tried to treat people right, and even though I said I was a yes person, and I try to say yes as much as I can, you know, it's, it's also about, you know, relationships. Right. You know, right. So I've been very fortunate to have uh, cultivated some, some great relationships in the music business and the fashion business. I used to manage uh, Maurice Malone. Different generations. I guess I got four or five generations. Right. Now, I'm, you know, I'm working with the people that are in their 20s that are uh, stylists. Nice. So, you know, I try to keep the door open and try to help where I can where, you know, it makes sense. Right, right. You don't make money off of everything that you do, but I'd like to extend myself where I can. Right, right, right. You know, I think if you're honest with yourself and your customers, um, that's going to take you a long way. I agree. And that's that's really, you know, that do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, uh, that's kind of like my motto. I'm in downtown Detroit because I wanted to be close to the water, the closer to the water, the the better. Mm-hmm. Live, work, and play in downtown Detroit is another one of my uh, models. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, that's it. You gotta build those relationships with your financial people, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, be able to have those relationships with people. You know, it's you when you call. You know. Mm-hmm. For for me, I'm I'm just in awe uh, as far as how she has been able to still um, be 
around and be significant to um, you know the 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 entrepreneur and 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 small businesses you know of detroit i mean man you, you know she outlasted the the jl hudson building you know what i mean like <laughs> like you know that within itself is uh is is a huge uh feat uh you know at one point she was the only tenant in her building and for those of you who are not familiar with the building that she's in it is huge right uh, when I went back to Detroit uh, about what three or so years ago, when we were uh, there, yeah, yeah, we they were uh, refurbishing the building and you know really making it look nice, and um, you know she has maintained man, and um, you know to me that's 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 impressive, you know what I mean? Like my thing was, you know, what would you tell your your younger self? And she was like, hey be honest, work hard. Um, she said uh, relationships, having those relationships ha has been very key to uh, her success, you know, as well. So, yeah, it was it was it was an awesome interview. Zaina and my uncle who mm. just passed, uh, Eli, uh, they was real good friends. Right. Mm. He'd be telling me about Zayna. He'd be like, man, I want you to meet Zayna. Da, da, da. But I was like, bro, I don't want to go. Why would I want to do that? You know, but he was like, you got to go to spectacles. You got to do this. You got to do that. And then years later, bro, I'm one of her biggest fans. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it, 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 like her, Teresa Hill, you know, of course, mm. Todd, right. you know, but it, it's a few people, you know, that I really I just like how they've invested their lives into this uh, music and mm -hmm. they're still out here uh, representing it. You know what I mean? It's not like they're uh, on the sidelines. Like Zayna is still the conduit to Jeff Mills. You know, mm -hmm. Zayna still has pop-ups where DJs, any number of DJs from whatever era are playing in her store. Her support of the dance music community in Detroit is uh, one of her, her greatest uh, gifts to us. You know, when you see that old picture of her in front of the record store, I want to say it's from like the 60s or 70s, right. it's like, wow, uh, to look at her now and think about how much she's given to the uh, overall like community and dance music community, it's just, mm -hmm. it's mind boggling, you know? Yes, indeed. My history, but, you know, got to give love to the women and the men who paved the way for, uh, you know, our our ancestors, you know, who uh, who made the music, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric, for joining us. Team like Reggie, Dave, Reddy, made it. Well, guys, hope you enjoyed our fifth God Said Give Them Drum Machines Behind the Scenes podcast. Make sure that you follow us, please, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the streaming platforms that deal with podcasts. You can find us. OK, remember, the film is out in summer 2021. We cannot wait for you to see it. Also, don't forget to head over to our website. God said, give them drum machines dot com. That's G S G E D M dot com forward slash shop. You can go to our website and check out our merch. We still got uh, some great sales, uh, discounted prices for you. I have a new shirt that was sent to me that I'm excited about wearing this summer. So make sure you check out the new merch as well. Guys, we appreciate all of you for supporting our independent filmmaking journey. Just wanted to give a special shout out to uh, Tyler in Arizona, David in Wisconsin, Christian in Germany, Bobby in Illinois, Jordan in New York, Roosevelt in Michigan, Matthew in Illinois, Juan in Louisiana, David in Belfast. Guys, thank you so much for buying merch from our website. Also, don't forget to check us out on SoundCloud where you can listen to Eddie Folks. That's DJ Eddie Flashing Folks, our boy from Detroit. You can check out his uh, New Year's mix on SoundCloud. And, you know, you can also head over to our YouTube where you can uh, watch the uh, Detroit Sound Project Vault. Shout out to uh, EPM Music team, Oliver, Addy, and Jonas. Also want to give a special shout out to uh, 
output for supplying me uh, with those great sounds in order to score uh, the documentary, God Said Give Them Drum Machines. Also, we want to give a big thanks to Fusicology, our girl Ozia Shane and Amy. We appreciate you both. Stay updated with us on Facebook and Instagram at God Said Give Them Drum Machines. This month, we'll be sharing lots with you to celebrate Black History Month and honor some of the greats. Guys, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next month.